All right, hello AP Calculus. This is 2.4, Continuity and One-Sided Limits. I'm gonna fly through this kind of quick because there are a lot of slides, all right? And I did a practice run at this and it took me a long time. And I'm gonna to try to do it a little more quickly and a little more smooth. However, if there's a moment where you're a little stuck, pause it or go back a little bit and see if you can Make some better sense of what we're talking about if I tend to go a little fast, okay? So let me get into it. Let's talk about continuity. Continuity, or just things being continuous at a certain point C, must follow these three conditions. Okay? Understand that a point C is like an X value. Okay, so let me draw a picture as we talk about this. And... I'm going to draw an f of x curve here, and we'll talk about this curve at some point C. Okay, so the first condition is this, is that the limits as x approaches C for this function f of x, which I will label over here, must exist, okay? That means there must be some limit here, okay? And if I look at C, which is, gosh, right here with respect to this f of x curve, if I go from the left side, and if I go from the right side, you can see that it does approach some value for a y, okay? And I'm just gonna call this y L, okay? So, um, so yeah, the limit must exist. And it doesn't look like there's anything that breaks here or suggests that um, it's, it's, uh, that the limit doesn't exist. It does seem to have a nice flow from both the left and the right. It looks like it both goes to the same y value, okay? Second thing is, is that f of c must exist, okay? So if you look here, there's no open circle here. That does look like there is a point there. And so, in my opinion, yeah, there is an f of c, okay? It exists right there. Okay. And then your final item, okay, is that whatever you have here and whatever you have here, these two things must be equal to each other, all right? So not only does the limit have to exist for this x value c, but there must also be a point there. You cannot have an open circle, basically, okay? And so... My third part is the limits as x approaches c of f of x, okay, must equal f of c, okay? So whatever you get here and whatever you get here, those must be the same, okay? All right, and that's what continuity is. It's basically looking at limits and just making sure there is a, a point there, okay, that, that there's not a hole there. So let's take a look at... Um, a couple questions with this piecewise function. I'm going to ask for three parts here, four parts, sorry, um, items for one, two, three, and four for a limit. Does the limit exist at each of these points? Take a minute maybe and pause this, all right, and see if you can answer these questions based off of what we learned in a previous lesson, okay, and then I'll give you the answers after that. Okay, so when you pause it and Try this work. If you did x equals one, the limits as x approaches one from the left side for this function f of x, uh, you can see one is right here. Okay, and then from the left side, it looks like it gets closer to zero. And from the right side, okay, it's equal to one, okay? And so does the limit exist? Well, based off our rules before, since these do not match up, those results are different, um, we say the limit does not exist, okay? So um, I'm gonna just write that here, DNE does not exist. At two, if I'm gonna do the same thing, the limit as X approaches two from the left, you can see that it gets closer and closer and closer to this respective y value, which is one. 
And since your limit as x approaches 2 from the right side for f of x, that means you're going to go from this direction. Yeah, that's also equal to 2. All right. Sorry, not equal to. It's equal to 1. Okay. So again, I'm looking for the, the vertical distance for each of these um, from the left side and the right side. They both give me a height of 1. And so since these are equal, then you would say yes. The limit does exist at two. If you test three, okay, three is right here, and I know some of you are eyeballing it, saying, "I already know that this limit does exist." Yes, from the left side and from the right side. Okay, they both approach this y value of two. Okay, so yes, the limit as x approaches three from the left is equal to the limit as x approaches 3 from the right. Okay, since they are both equal to a value of 2, then you're right. Um, it does have a limit, and it's at 2. All right, finally, does a limit exist here at 4? Well, there is a limit from the left side. Okay. If we look at this, it looks like it approaches 1. Okay. But there is no limit as x approaches 4 in the more positive direction, okay, or from the right side. Okay, so because it does not exist on one of the two sides, that means the overall limit does not exist. Okay. All right, so review there. Hopefully that all made sense. All right, and now we're going to add the new piece to it, the part that um, is new for us today. Okay. If I want to know if things are continuous at x equals 2, I need to use the three rules to help describe. Okay. So I know some of these answers already. The limits as x approaches 2 from the left side and the right side was determined in the previous question, and that is equal to 1. My second rule is the limit as x approaches 2, uh, sorry, I'm stuck on limits. All right, second part, does f of 2 exist? Okay. And it does, there is a point at 2, and if you go up, it's exactly right there. And it happens to be two also. And then the third thing is, does the limit as x approach two for your function f of x, is that equal to f of two? Okay. And the answer is, of course, no. Okay. And the reason why this gives you a value of one, this gives you a value of two, and because of that, what we'll say is it is not continuous okay, at x equals 2. Okay, and what I'm going to do further is I'm going to say f of x is not continuous at x equals 2. It's not enough just to say not continuous because we have to identify the location. There are many places where they are continuous. Okay. Okay, if that makes sense, let's test three. Okay, at x equals three, is it continuous? And some of you will eyeball these in your head and say, I can tell the answer before I write all this stuff down. Do I actually have to write this scripting? And the answer is yes. On our free response AP test, this is the, the script they want in order for you to demonstrate your understanding by definition of what continuity is. Okay, so you have to humor them. The limit as x approaches 3 was found in the previous question. We said it was equal to 2. Does f of 3 exist? Yes, it does. f of 3 is 2. And so does the limit as x approach 2 of f of x equal to f of 2? And the answer is yes. Okay, they're both equal to 2. Um, so what that means is this is continuous 
at x equals 3. Okay, and notice above it, I'm going to say f of x is continuous at x equals 3. That's what makes it complete. That's the answer they're looking for. All right. Where is f of x discontinuous? Okay, meaning where is it not continuous? Well, certainly at 1. Okay. At 1, the limit doesn't exist. And if the limit doesn't exist, that means that it cannot... Um, have it be continuous at that point, okay? It's also not continuous at two, okay? But it's continuous everywhere else between one and four, okay? And again, if you're not comfortable with that, you're like, that looks like a coordinate, here's what I'm writing, okay? So there you go. All right. If there's no further questions on that, we understand what continuous is. It's basically the limit has to exist there and there must be a point, then we are set. All right, pause this video for a moment and see if you can do this, okay? See, is the function continuous at negative two, okay, which is right here? Is it at negative four? Is it at, does the limit exist at negative two? And where is the function not discontinuous now, but where is it continuous? Pause this, give it a try on your own, and see if you got it. All right, let me see what answers I have for you. I'm gonna go with dark blue. All right, is the function continuous at negative two? Well, negative two is right here. And what I will say is that the limits as x approaches negative two of, now this is g of x now, so I'm gonna call this g of x, okay, is equal to, let's see, my limit is equal to three, because from the left side and the right side, I said that backwards, okay, they both approach this value of three. Okay. And then I'm gonna ask, what is g of negative two? g of negative two is, well, my point is actually at five. Okay. And are these equal? They are not. Okay, so we would say it's not continuous. Continuous at x equals negative 2. All right, and largely it's because your limit as x approaches 2 of g of x Okay, is not equal to your g of negative two. Sorry, this should be a negative here. Cool. All right, people are like, do I have to write this? Yes, you do. Okay, again, that's AP structure. If you don't do that, then they frown upon that. They don't want you to just say, hey, you know what, the point doesn't match up. They want you to actually know what the complete definition is. All right, is the function continuous at negative four? Well, here's negative four. All right, and so here's what I'm going to say. The limits as x approaches negative four of g of x is equal to g of negative four, okay, which is equal to negative two. Okay, so I just said, you know what, here's the first rule, it does exist, and here's the second rule, that also does exist, and they're both equal to the same thing. So um, I'm gonna say yes, g of x is continuous at x equals negative four, okay? Here's what you don't wanna do. You just don't wanna say yes and just leave your answer that way. You have to have a good justification. The justification is more important than the answer yes or no, all right? All right, if I look at x equals negative two, negative two is right here. I wanna know does the limit exist, exist for g of x? And so you're like, well, this is kind of backwards. Don't we kind of answer this? Maybe so, but I will humor them anyways. The limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left 
is equal to neg uh, positive three. And the limits as x approaches negative two from the right of g of x is equal to also three. And so you will say yes. Okay. Um, not only does it exist, but it exists at three. Okay. All right, where is it continuous? Okay, so continuous means, um, let's see. Well, if I go from left to right, it looks like it's continuous, assuming that this goes down forever from negative infinity to the spot where it's finally not continuous. Okay, and that's at negative two. We always write these in terms of x. In terms of x. Okay, and then it's continuous again until we get down to here. Now, the negative three is not significant to us. It's in terms of x. So we will say from negative two, to positive one, okay? And then it starts back up way up here and it's continuous from one to, it looks like it gets closer and closer and closer to this value four. Okay, and then finally, up at the very top here, again, assuming these go forever, from four to, infinity. Okay, it's continuous. All right. These places in between, okay, those are where it's discontinuous. So it's discontinuous at negative two, it's discontinuous at one, it's discontinuous at four. Okay, for this g of x. Okay, if your item is discontinuous because of a point, guess what? We call that point discontinuity. Okay. If you ever have an asymptote that makes it discontinuous, you call it asymptotic. Okay, and finally, this one's a little bit different. This is um, like a jump, okay? Now you'd have to have a point filled in. So imagine, let me redraw this just for a little bit here. Let's say you had like an open circle here and then you had a closed circle and that was filled in. If you ever have a jump like this where it just kind of stops and then you jump up to the next part of the function through your piecewise, that's exactly what they call it, jump discontinuity. Okay, so know those vocabulary words. They're not um, asked a lot. Really just recognizing that it's discontinuous is what's most important, but sometimes they want a specific name, okay? And those are the three different types, okay? All right, let's move on. All right, using continuity in a piecewise function, okay? Um, and with that, we're gonna look at just some limits, all right? So if we look at this first one, the limit as x approaches three from the negative direction. Typically I would say, hey, let's plug in three and see if it works. Can't do that because that will get you undefined. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna draw a couple graphs. Now, if I just had, gosh, three over x instead of three over x minus three, that's not too much different than one over x. And we know what this looks like. Okay, that's one over x. We talked about that a couple days ago, all right? The fact there's a three on top, um, all it says is that this may look a little bit more L-like, okay? Because things will increase and decrease more quickly depending on whether you go to zero or whether you go to infinity. 
Okay. The fact that this says subtract three to it though, means this is your H and you're gonna shift this three spots. Okay, so this is your picture. Okay. And so if I wanna know what happens to your limit as you go from three to the left side? Well, the left side is over here. And so as you follow this from the left side, okay, you can see that it goes to, gosh, it looks like it goes down forever. And down forever with respect to Y means it is negative infinity, okay? Do you have to draw, draw a graph of that? You don't necessarily have to, because some people in their head kind of know what this looks like, but I don't want to get these wrong when I do these. And so I take a little extra time to do this just to make sure I got it right. Okay. All right, next one. A little bit awkward here. Um, and you may kind of notice that there's some, um, some items in both your numerator and denominator that make this um, reducible, all right? So if I look at this, you may notice that this is the same thing as x plus seven and x minus seven, all right? And why is that important? Well, if I took the seven from the beginning and put it into each of these, I would end up with, well, zero on the top and zero on the bottom, okay? I can't have that, okay? Now, with this, you'll notice this numerator almost matches, well, it almost matches this guy. Okay, in fact, it's just, it's really just the opposite of what this guy is. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pull out a negative. If that makes sense. And just pull out a sign, a negative one. And then rewrite this negative seven plus X as X minus seven, okay? And that way these will go away, All right? Now, Here's the last thing. While seven didn't work when you inputted it before, take a look at it now. Okay, and it's a little bit of a trick because sometimes this number here that's out front is pivotal in this denominator. And while your asymptote does exist within this rational function, it exists at negative seven, not at seven. So all you have to do from here is just plug in the number seven. Okay, and there's your answer. But again, you can't really get that until you factor and reduce. And some of them are a little bit kind of ugly like that. Okay. By the way, if you left your answer like this, you would get all your points. You don't actually have to do this part. But again, the back of the book won't write it like this, but AP will accept that. Okay. All right, natural log of X minus two. Now here's an important feature of this guy. Remember what the natural log of x looks like. It crosses here at one, like all logarithms do, for the most part, at least all the parent ones do. And then it goes down here forever. There is an asymptote at x equals zero. Okay. And so here's what this means. Remember, this is your h. It means you gotta shift it to the right. So here's one, here's two. Okay, which means it'll cross here at three. Like this. Okay, now, because there's a plus sign here, I can really only test the limits as X approach, approaches two from the left side. This no longer exists because that was just the parent function of it. And if I go closer and closer to two, this gets smaller and smaller. And that means it also goes to negative infinity. Okay. People say, do I have to graph this? You don't, but it's easier for me to do them this way, okay? All right, last one of this type. Um, you're looking at this, and you're like, well, if I put in 81 here, and if I put in 81 here, well, I will get nine minus nine over 81 minus 81, and that gives me zero over zero, and that's not an answer we're allowed to have, okay? So here's what I'm gonna do. Um, this will look weird and kind of uncomfortable, but it works. 
And I'm showing this to you because you're probably going to have something like this in your homework. And most people wouldn't think of doing this problem this way. Here's what we know. This guy here can be rewritten. Okay. And here's how I'm going to do it. Do it off to the side. I'm going to write this as the difference of two perfect squares. Kind of like if I had this, if I had, um, let me just write it up here. X squared minus nine. Ah, minus nine. Let me get rid of this because I don't want that equal to sign. Okay, we all know that that is x plus 3 and x minus 3 based off saying that this is really x squared minus 3 squared. Okay, same idea. The back term 81 is the same as 9 squared. I don't think many people would argue that. Okay, now how do I write x as something squared? Well, I will awkwardly write it as the square root of x squared. And I think most people would agree that the square root of x squared does give you that, but it's kind of an obscure way of representing it. Okay. Now, why do I do that? Well, because if I can do this and translate it to that form of a factor, then I can do the same thing with this, which means I have the square root of x, and the square root of x, and one is a plus nine, and a one is a minus nine. Okay, and why is that cool for us? Well, these are conveniently made so that these will go away. And you're left with one over the square root of x plus nine. And so once you plug in 81, You get one over nine plus nine, which is 118. Cool. All right, so think about factoring, okay? If you plug things and get zero over zero, that's not gonna work, okay? And you can see that happen a couple times in our problem here. Sometimes it just gave us um, an undefined to begin with, but the idea is that you should be able to factor these kind of bothersome expressions and um, reduce them in such a way that once you plug these items in, it should work out nicely, okay? Be careful of these. Um, these exist quite a bit, and so do these natural logs, all right? And they are um, very represented in these one-sided um, piecewise functions, or sorry, one-sided um, uh, continuous problems, okay? All right, where is the function discontinuous? All right, let me find that guy. Discontinuous. Well, let's take a look at this. f of x equals x squared minus 2x plus 8. I, I don't really quite know what this looks like, other than it is a parabola. That's what happens when you have an x squared. All right, and I know it goes up because it's positive here. I don't really have to know anything else, okay? And the reason why is, is based off just a parabola, there's nothing that says that I will have an undefined. I can plug anything I want into x and get a nice number, all right? And so because of that, it is not discontinuous. Okay, parabolas are never discontinuous. There's a point everywhere on this curve. Okay, and it doesn't jump or break or anything like that. Okay, same thing with your sine curve. Okay, if you think about sine, it does this, and it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. Okay, this is maybe two pi, this is pi, et cetera, okay? And the idea is that there are no breaks or asymptotes or holes or any of that nature. And so this is also not discontinuous. Okay, I'm gonna say g of x. f of x. All right. All right, now when you get to cotangent, are you, you ask yourself, well, are all trig functions not, sorry, discontinuous? Not discontinuous? No, there, some of them may be. In fact, if you just look at tangent, tangent is also a 
negative Travolta. Okay, and this is pi over two, and this is negative pi over two. And so, yeah, you, you keep drawing more of these, but at every pi over two, and then three pi over two, and five pi over two, you have an asymptote. And that's where those items are discontinuous, okay? Now, some of you are like, well, that's tangent. What about cotangent? Not a lot of people remember this because we don't have to graph these very often, but cotangent looks just like cotangent, uh, except it actually goes the actual Travolta way. Okay, so it looks like the, inverse representation, and it's also shifted, okay? So this is zero, and this is pi over uh, pi, sorry. And if you were to draw the next one, you would have two pi, okay? And then at three pi, and so on, okay? So where is it discontinuous? Where basically where, where all these asymptotes are, okay? And so if I'm gonna write a set of answers that represents every single asymptote, what I'm gonna do is start with the first one, which is at zero. And I'm gonna say every pi that we travel to the right or to the left, okay, it'll be discontinuous. So I'm gonna put a k here. And you're like, what is k? k could be any integer. Okay, now if you're not sure what an integer is, that's number like one, two, three, four, five. And if you were to plug any of those in for this k it would just multiply it by the pi and it would extend it out in any direction, okay? It also includes zero and negative one, negative two, negative three, and so on. So that's what a, an integer is. Not that you have to write this, you just have to write that, okay? This makes it complete. Most people look at this and say, isn't that the answer? And you're right, but there are a lot of answers, okay? And so that's why we create this interval. Not an interval, but a solution that is um, represented at an interval of pi. Okay. All right, next one. This one may be pretty easy. Um, this one down here, where am I at, where am I at, where am I at? Draw for me, draw for me, draw for me. Oh, there we go. Okay, so at x equals negative five, that's where it's discontinuous at. Okay, so I'll say j of x is discontinuous. at x equals five. Okay, and of course we know that that is an asymptote, all right? So um, at negative five is where you're gonna have this big break and um, yeah, it's just not gonna be able to work there. Okay. It's gonna fit, I'm just make this complete. All right, last one is a piecewise function. And let's see, I'm gonna draw this out because I think this will be really helpful if I do, for me. All right, and I'm tired of working with green. So let me get a different color here. I will go with black. All right, so I've got negative two X and um, I know what that looks like, that's a line. And let's see, I only want for values less than two. So I'm gonna go over here, there's two. When I input two into here, I get negative four. So what I know is, is that it should go down to negative four. And I'm gonna fill that circle in because I see right here, Sorry, that I have a, I have an equal to sign there, okay? And um, if I filled in a couple of points, there's zero, zero, there's two, uh, one, negative two, and this will actually go forever to the left in the negative direction, okay? All right, now for this guy, this is a, Let's make this black so you know that. Um, that's a parabola. I know you know that. And so we're like, I don't quite know what that looks like because it's kind of a weird one. And can you put it in your graphing calculator? You certainly could. Um, what I do know is if I plug in two here for my x, okay, I'm gonna get four minus eight plus one. Okay, do I have to show this work? You don't, but 
the important feature is that you know that it finishes at negative three. Okay, so at two, it finishes at negative three. And if you draw this in your graphing calculator, you'll notice that it gives you something like this. Okay, now you'll know because this is x is greater than two that it goes to the right. That is drawn correctly because you'll notice this is a function, okay? And if I do my vertical line test, just going up and down, this part doesn't overlap that part vertically in any way. Okay. You can see that it is discontinuous at two. Okay, so I'm gonna say that k of x is discontinuous Continue. Let's see you. There's no line there. Okay, at x equals two. Okay. So um, notice here that because of this, there is um, again it's discontinuous. And I'm going to ask you what type of discontinuity is it? Based off the previous slide. There was points, there was asymptotic, there was jump, and you're right, this is a jump discontinuity. Now, they'll also ask, are these removable? If you have any that are discontinuous, are they removable? And what that means is it's removable, meaning if you were to just plug in the point where it's open, would it finally be continuous? Okay, so imagine if I had this. Okay, and say this is C. For something to be removable, what it means is the only thing that's holding us back from making this continuous is that open circle, all right? Is that the case here? No, it's not. And the reason why is because it's not a point that's holding it back, it's the whole asymptotes that exist, okay? So this is not removable. Um, same thing on here. While there's an open circle here, it's the jump that's making this discontinuous, okay? So in this case, it's also not removable. Okay, and finally, this last one, yeah, this deals with an asymptote, and again, this is not removable. Okay, so none of them turned it out to be something that looked like this, and you can even have a point up there, okay? But the idea is that, if the reason why your um, function is discontinuous is because of a point, then we can say it's removable, okay? All right, this is the last one. Let me see if I'm covering up the directions. I'm not, I'll go back. Okay, and here's what it says. Find the values for A and B so that this item will be continuous. Okay, now I don't have a B in this problem, okay, but I do have an A, and sometimes you're going to have to play with these to find more than one variable, okay? Now, here's the idea, okay? This is more of a basic one. There'll be others that you're going to have to think about a little more deeply, and they're kind of like puzzles. All right, so here's what I got. You have something that's to the left, okay, of, we'll say the um, y-axis, okay, and then this part is to the right of the y-axis, okay, so um, I don't know if you remember what this is. Remember that 2 sine x over x will eventually give you 1. Okay, and it gives you a picture, if you were to graph it, um, kind of like this. Okay, kind of like that. All right, now I don't know what this is, except that I do know that it must be some type of line because that's negative four X, um, and that is a slope. And A is a constant, which means I'm just going to shift it up or down some amount. Okay, and here's the deal. I know when I plug in zero for this, okay, 
that I should get a value of one based off what this picture looks like, okay? Remember that that is a rule that we have learned, okay? So I know that when x is zero, my output must be equal to one, okay? And that must be the same rule for what I have on the second part, and that's how you do these problems, okay? I know that for the second piece here, regardless of what it looks like, that if I plug in zero for x and work it out, I should get something equal to one. Okay, I know that this has to equal one because that's what happened on the top. You got one as an answer when you inputted this x. All right, so I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna plug in my x value of zero. Okay, and work it out. Now some people are like, it's not really equal to zero. That's okay, that's where the boundary is, okay? And let's see, I've got minus, basically zero is equal to one. So A is equal to one, okay? And you now have found what A is in order to make this continuous. If I were to now graph this line, it now has a y-intercept of one. There's an open circle there and that's okay. And now your slope is four. Ooh, negative four. One, two, three, four. Okay. And I'll just say that we will graph this downwards. And the idea, uh, let me erase it. Okay. Excuse me. I'll keep going here. <sighs> That's okay. Like raw three. <laughs> Things are going so smooth. Okay. Um, it looks something like this. Okay. And so this is what you have to do. The big thing is you don't have to graph it. You just got to figure out where do these connect, okay? And they connect by plugging in zeros, whatever this is, into each of the x's, and one of them will solve nicely, okay? I know this is one, and then you have to take that result and set that equal to the other expression that you're given, okay, the other part of the function. All right, I hope that makes sense. There are some challenging ones of those, but there's only like two, okay? And I'm gonna get my axis back. All right, those are problem solving ones. Give them a try. The longer you stick with it, the more proficient you're gonna be. But it's always the same thing. Input x, okay, between the two that you got, okay? One will solve for y nicely. Okay, and once you solve that one for y, set that equal to the other. Okay, but you have to plug in X to both of them, okay? If you have three of them, just pair them up two at a time, okay? All right, here's the last 